Welcome back to the show. I'm here today with uh, CEO and, and founder of Clean Incentive, Casey Martinez. Uh, Casey's working on a really important problem where we're trying to um, address this, the status quo of overdevelopment uh, in, in renewable projects and instead say, how can we optimally reallocate capital resources to maximize our carbon impact? Casey, tell us about how we actually need to do that. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's a it's a nuanced problem with mm -hmm. the energy transition that um, many people feel you can just throw billions of dollars at the problem, deploy as much generation as possible, and we will solve climate change. <clears throat> I think folks in the industry understand that that the problem is much more complex. That there is, um, you know, there is transmission constraints. Mm -hmm. There are storage grid reliability constraints, and there's um there's also the other side which is these corporate buyers of mm. power and how they think about um uh, you know purchasing this uh, these ppas and these other these other ways of of purchasing renewable energy and the overdevelopment problem is is really seen in markets like california and texas where there's a large amount of penetration of renewables and therefore uh, curtailment. Mm -hmm. And specifically, that's the problem and the harm that I'm trying to to solve and work on um, to help the industry grow in the right directions and make, at the end of the day, the carbon impact that the energy transition needs. Megawatt hours and generation is sort of an intermediate step. Most people don't really care about megawatt mm -hmm. hours mm -hmm. and about delivery of power. They want reliable power and cheap power, but really the switch between or the switch from fossil fuels to renewables is all about carbon. So in our business, Clean Incentive, we're sort of changing the, the scope of energy procurement to focus on the avoided emissions of the renewable generation or the battery assets to make sure that uh, a corporate buyer that has induced emissions from consuming energy at a certain location at a certain time has avoided the same amount of energy from their contracted power, their PPAs from renewable uh, assets. So that solves the overdevelopment issue by um, creating a premium for projects that are built closer to the cities. Mm -hmm. um, so right now that curtailment problem exists because wind in West Texas cannot be, that power cannot be delivered effectively to Dallas-Fort Worth, Austin, Houston because of the transmission uh, constraints there. So encouraging a project developer to build a solar facility in Houston suburbs or you know where the cities are, where the data centers are and the manufacturing is, that, pro that project should be worth a lot more and mm -hmm. should have a lot more value than a project built way out in the middle of nowhere that has trouble getting to market. So so to to reiterate, th this is a problem as old as Iracot in some ways, where we, we have a lot of wind generation in West Texas, and literally the tubes, the transmission line is full and and can't get enough. And so when you say curtailment, are they, they're just turning off the wind turbine or feathering them so they can't produce That's anymore. Right. And um, what I'm hearing is the, the the current system is set up where there, there actually isn't a strong enough market incentive to kind of bring these assets closer in. Is that a, a fundamental function of how like the the pricing mechanism is set today with ERCOT, or is it because there really is no there, there's really no carbon measurement or offset measurement in the current mechanism? Right. Yeah. I mean, the root causes of this uh, rely or come from sort of the good intentions of REC mm -hmm. markets and tax credit markets, mm -hmm. where the government tries to incentivize the right thing, but what end up ha end up end up happens is mm -hmm. that a renewable project will sometimes generate power into negative pricing mm -hmm. or be built in a place where a significant part of the time they are curtailed because they're still getting the funding and the money from these tax incentives and these other things that aren't really pure market signals. Mm -hmm. You know, if it was, if if you were only paid for the avoided emissions of a project or for the amount of generation that actually got to market that actually caused a gas or coal plant to shut down or to reduce that would in our minds fix this sort of market um mm -hmm. misallocation or this this function that's not working well 
because then you, you would the project would not pencil out if it couldn't make a meaningful carbon impact or take that that power to market. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So so it's really moving away from like rewarding the project and the generation of electricity, but more how is it actually helping us move away from the fossil right. fuel emissions? And so then how are you solving that problem through your solution? Right. Um, and I don't want to discount mm -hmm. how difficult it is to develop a, a wind and solar farm. It's incredibly hard with the land and the, and the mm -hmm. permits and project finance and cost of capital. With all those constraints and all those difficulties, it's much easier to develop where the resource is. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, that's not where the cities are, right? So in order to develop where this, these projects closer to what, where the cities are, it's just going to be more expensive. Mm -hmm. The land and the permitting is more complex, typically. So for the project finance to, to work out, there needs to be a premium somehow mm -hmm. for those projects. And right now, a REC or Renewable Energy Certificate, they're all treated the same under the Greenhouse Gas Protocol. Mm -hmm. So Scope 2 guidance shows that every megawatt hour or every REC is the same. Mm -hmm. But in reality, they're not all the same. Mm -hmm. And so somehow you need to differentiate that. And so the solution that we came up with is to take a megawatt hour of generation at a certain location at a certain time and use marginal emissions um, from data providers like Resurity and Watt Time and others to quantify the avoided emissions of that megawatt hour at that location and that time because it varies quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So not, I already sort of described the locational difference of mm -hmm. grid impact, um, but there's also a time impact as well or a time dimension to that. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the easiest illustration is the solar duck curve in California. Mm -hmm. Generating more solar energy in the middle of the day is not going to make a meaningful impact on, on the fossil fuel generators that are balancing the grid mm -hmm. because the grid is fairly saturated with solar at that hour. Mm. But if you're somehow able to um, re you know, generate renewables in the nighttime or during that dusk mm -hmm. window where solar comes offline and there typically is gas thermal plants ramping up, that would be much of it more valuable megawatt hour because of the grid impact. So, um, so time and location is very important for renewable generation. And so um, I can explain marginal emissions and how those things are, how that data is, is um, collected and, and quantified. But that's the key missing ingredient that mm -hmm. I think needs to be associated with RECs or associated mm -hmm. with generation to sort of fix this problem and to tell the whole story about, uh, about renewable generation. Mm -hmm. So it's, so what are you really then calculating for that megawatt hour? The right. avoidance of emission? Like what are you calculating in your analysis? Yeah. So um, yeah. just to back up and talk about emissions, grid emissions data yeah. a little bit more broadly and then answer your question. Yeah. Um, the location-based scope two guidance uses what's called grid average emissions. So if there's quite a bit of hydro, mm -hmm. nuclear, a large base load, of carbon-free energy, call it. It doesn't have to be renewables. <clears throat> that average emissions for that section of the grid is going to be fairly low, even if a gas thermal plant <clears throat> is balancing sort of the the grid at at the time. Mm -hmm. So the there's this average uh, there's this average emissions factor, but then there's also this fairly new different em emissions factor called marginal emissions, which is, I don't really care what generation is on the base load. Tell me what generator is actually on the margin, meaning which one is being ramped up and ramped down by the mm -hmm. grid operator mm -hmm. every hour mm -hmm. or even, you know, every five minutes or whatever it mm -hmm. is to maintain that grid stability and that uh, frequency and voltage. Mm -hmm. And if you can demonstrate that bringing on an additional megawatt hour of mm -hmm. renewables causes that marginal generator to decrease, then you've made a measurable amount mm -hmm. of avoided emissions. Mm -hmm. And so that, that, um, that impact on that marginal generator varies, like I said, across locations and across mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. So that's the data set that we think is very critical mm -hmm. and the appropriate data set to then merge or associate with the RECs mm -hmm. to tell the full story. 
So, so mm-hmm. just in very concrete terms, we're, we're, if we're talking about like there's a marginal producer, it is a coal power plant, mm-hmm. and if there's a way to measure, I have a battery that provides mm-hmm. a megawatt of power, and that means I can I can pull off this coal power plant. Mm-hmm. There's a there's a substantial marginal decrease in carbon intensity mm-hmm. from that trade off, and and if I heard you correctly, you you already have a firm that, firms that you can pull this data from. That's right. The key mm-hmm. here is you're linking that moment in time. To the renewable energy certificate that is cut for the for the generation, mm. be it a, a, a power a solar installation. I don't think there are recs for batteries yet, right? Am I no? <laughs> okay, well, we are working on that. Okay, um, that's exactly right. We mm. are the sort of independent data infrastructure platform that mm. merges um, the recs, mm-hmm. the meter data from the mm. project, and the avoided emissions from these data providers into a certificate that could then be used in a PPA. Mm, So we're trying to facilitate these PPAs or these transactions for these, um, you know, for the world or for these Mm. corporate off takers in a convenient way. Because this data problem I was describing, Mm -hmm. you know, it's somewhat complicated. There's a lot Mm. of moving parts. You don't want to have these uh, monstrosities of PPAs Mm. that have all these other uh, intermediaries and data mm. sources, and somebody's got to sort of settle these contracts on a regular mm. basis. We're tackling this problem by saying, let's simplify the PPAs, mm. um, but the, let's let's monetize the avoided emissions of those wrecks and of that generation using a certificate and a registry, mm. uh, so that that ownership of those avoided emissions can change hands mm. to the off taker for carbon accounting, but then the off taker can pay the developer for those avoided emissions. Mm. So to give you an example, might help sort of understand is that, um, you know, we want to facilitate what we call an impact PPA, meaning the off taker will pay a carbon price, let's just call it $100 a ton, for all the avoided emissions of this project over 10 years or say. Mm. And so we connect to the meter of that that project, um, all the recs are then Sort of brought into the clean incentive platform, and then we issue new certificates. We call power mm-hmm. emission certificates that will have the rec embedded along with the avoided emissions, and that is the set of certificates during that period of time that are then transferred to the off taker, and that is the amount of avoided emissions that we've certified as an independent mm-hmm. party in this mm-hmm. contract. And the off taker says, "Okay, we will honor our deal, and we'll pay." hundred dollars per ton back to the back to the developer mm-hmm. or the operator of that wind farm so it's a convenient um, platform for this PPA it's also uh, sort of um, provides a lot of security and a lot of immutability and data mm. you know integrity for how we're doing this we have a right. published methodology mm-hmm. for this mm-hmm. and um, and it's scalable so mm-hmm. now you don't have to have all these bespoke legal contracts with every developer um, you know, Amazon has, what is it, 400 different PPAs. Hmm. Um, you wouldn't have to do that 400 times in a unique way. You would be able to then say, let's just enter into a normal PPA and let's use the clean incentive platform to monetize mm-hmm. this. Mm-hmm. The The developer now has additional carbon revenue going into that project that wouldn't have been there otherwise. Um, that's based on the volume of avoided emissions. Mm. Now the corporate off taker also has a digital certificate that shows their avoided emissions. Mm. So now they can do what many in the industry are advocating uh, the greenhouse gas protocol to change uh, to, which is a uh, impact based scope Mm two framework. So I'm happy to go Mm -hmm. into some of the details of the greenhouse gas protocol, some of the revisions they're trying to make and a lot of the um, sort of proposals that they've been entertaining. Mm. But really, that's what we're trying to facilitate is get beyond this every rec and mm-hmm. every megawatt hour is the same to get to enable something that says this corporate mm-hmm. off-taker has now uh, proof of ownership of mm-hmm. avoided emissions mm-hmm. that can match all mm-hmm. their induced emissions from mm-hmm. their operations. Mm-hmm. How, how do you make money? <laughs> <laughs> the important question. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, we, um, we make money in two ways. One is we have a sort of a standard... Um, issuance fee for creating these certificates and Mm. for uh, just operating the platform, connecting to the meters of these um, facilities. Um, But if we can facilitate these impact PPAs, Mm -hmm. then there would probably be a broker fee involved Mm -hmm. of a certain amount 
um, just to help with facilitating the the, the PPAs. Mm. The, those are two different revenue streams from two different, you could call it activities on the platform. Mm. Um, so Rex have what we call a merchant market for, okay. for buying and selling Rex separate from a PPA. Mm -hmm. And that's where the issuance fee mm -hmm. revenue can mm -hmm. come in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you're a mom and pop store or, or business and you can't afford these multi-million dollar PPAs, uh, you can still reach your goals, your mm -hmm. sustainability goals, without having to go through like a green tariff or something with your utility. Mm -hmm. You could just buy some RECs or buy our, our PECs on our platform. Mm -hmm. uh, also retail customers, you know, like yourselves, if you want to just uh, purchase those for enhanced sustainability, mm -hmm. you can do that. Um, the PPAs, which are much more complicated or much more, um, you know, large company focused, brokering those would be sort of a separate line mm -hmm. of business mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to help uh, really make sure that those are done correctly and to actually uh, match the producers who are building impactful projects with the corporate off takers who really value going above and beyond the minimum mm -hmm. requirements of the greenhouse gas pro protocol. Mm -hmm. So your primary customer then is the off taker right. and, but is it also dependent on having the developers and and other parties on the platform yeah so yeah. um corporate buyers are leading mm -hmm. in this area mm -hmm. there's uh, a organization called the emissions first partnership which was founded i think two years ago mm -hmm. when the greenhouse guest protocol and wri that's the the world resource institute mm -hmm. who manages mm -hmm. the greenhouse gas protocol they um, they acknowledge that the current scope two framework is lacking, and mm -hmm. there's been a lot of discussion about how it's broken. And they 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 signaled they're going to open up for comment to hear revisions, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. hear proposals for revisions. And so this industry group formed. Mm -hmm. It's a um, it's led by Meta and AWS, and I think six or seven other mm -hmm. companies. Mm -hmm. And they've all written some policy papers and have advocated for this impact-based scope too, which is it's not enough to buy a REC. That REC needs to have some data about the aborted emissions. And the, the beautiful, beautiful thing about this framework is that the same methodology that quantifies the aborted emissions of generation can quantify the induced emissions mm. of consumption. Mm -hmm. So now you have the same methodology mm -hmm. that can be used for both. Mm -hmm. So now if a data center is located outside of Houston, where it takes a significant amount of, of um, gas uh, thermal generation to balance the grid, that, and it operates 24-7 uh, every hour of the day, that's gonna induce a lot more emissions than if that data center was outside of Amarillo or Lubbock mm -hmm. or, um, or somewhere mm -hmm. else. So it gives the market signal to locate and operate your loads in a different way mm -hmm. to reduce your induced emissions. Mm -hmm. And it also sends the market signal to your your um, your renewable PPAs or your, your selection of PPAs to source them with the greatest avoided emissions. Mm -hmm. So it really fixes this market signal problem I described earlier, which is, um, you know, let's align everything so that the, the, the corporation has carbon matching in their scope too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, this is an alternative to the, the other proposed major mm -hmm. proposal, which is a 24-7 hourly matching mm -hmm. framework. Mm -hmm. And so I'm happy to go into those details because there are some there are some trade-offs or there are some uh, interesting comparisons between the two frameworks and why I believe carbon matching is going to be the successful one. Mm -hmm. um, but the, uh, that's, the, that's the corporate, mm -hmm. that's the demand driver for these corporates to, okay. to use our platform. So, so that kind of answers mm. the question, like, why is the time now mm. and why, why didn't this um, need exist five to 10 years ago? But you're also using an underlying technology here. Do you want to get into that at all? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm happy to. Um, mm. Yeah, so the, the reasons why now is not just greenhouse gas protocol, but overall there's a number of mm. sort of um, corporate compliance type regulations that mm. are driving the conversation. Mm. Uh, you know, you're probably familiar with the carbon tariffs that mm -hmm. are coming up in Europe and elsewhere, the mandatory disclosures in California and mm -hmm. SEC. So there's sort of a lot of regulation. Mm -hmm. um, but also people are acknowledging that the status quo is 
is also open to greenwashing mm -hmm. in terms of buying the cheapest recs or the cheapest carbon offsets and making these sort of big claims at the corporate level mm -hmm. are no longer acceptable, mm -hmm. at least for for most uh, parts of society that that's sort of frowned upon. And so a lot of corporates and a lot, a lot of folks are looking for something that's either more robust on the data side mm. where the claim is stronger or just doing something that's beyond just buying your way out of the problem, which yeah. is just uh, what, what people are afraid of being accused of when it comes to these greenwashing mm. or reputational risk type issues, mm -hmm. um, which sort of segues to what you were talking about on the technology mm -hmm. side, which is how can you prove mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. avoided emissions or prove the carbon matching or improve the, uh, the claim. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that, that's where we're using, you know, both traditional technologies and, and new technologies as it relates to um, connecting to the, the meters with IoT devices, doing sustainability reports, that's all traditional. But tokenizing that in a, on the blockchain, on the public mm -hmm. blockchain, in a way that facilitates this registry and gives every certificate holder traceability and a cryptographic link back to the tokenized audit mm -hmm. uh, of the facility. So unlike Rex, um, there's a bit of nuance here, but if you own a Rex, typically you don't know exactly where it came from. Mm -hmm. What you, maybe you know which uh, balance authority or which grid it came from. Maybe you know which wind or solar farm it came from, but it doesn't really know. You don't really know when it was created. Maybe mm -hmm. you know what year it was created, but there's a lot of missing information there. Carbon mm -hmm. offsets, somewhat similar in that you could look up where they came from, and but a lot of times they're bought through brokers. Mm -hmm. And so in a lot of corporate sustainability reports, they're just mm -hmm. listed as we bought Vera certified or something mm. like that. But mm. there's a lot of missing uh, information that I think is is becoming much more demanded by customers and mm. investors now. So our digital certificates on our platform, you'll be able to see exactly when and where that was created. Mm -hmm. So now you can show that, um, that your investments or your PPAs or your purchases of these certificates all can all be traced back to impactful projects. And we're going also above and beyond the normal um, the grid emissions impact like I was describing, but also putting more sort of, I guess you call it qualitative information or, or, uh, or descriptions of the, in, the um, social impact of the project or the wildlife mm. impact mm. of the project or these other soft attributes mm -hmm. that a lot of corporates care about, you know, was, and we're not putting an opinion out there where we're really just collecting all the information so it can be monetized and mm -hmm. valued by the market. So if you if you did a greenfield project and you clear cut a bunch of trees to to build a solar farm, a lot of people wouldn't be want to be associated with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But if you were using a retired coal plant or a landfill or something or like sunny side, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that would be mm -hmm. different. If you were to invest in the local community where the project developer, you know, funded a school or built mm -hmm. facilities for the community, did jo job training. Those are all things that are in corporate RFPs for PPAs, but they're soft and mm -hmm. they're not beyond the press release it's on day opaque. one. Yeah. It's not something that can be traced back to the recs mm -hmm. or to the, mm -hmm. uh, to the holders of certificates. So we're trying to quantify all this okay. and we're trying to tokenize it in a way that will remove trust from us and remove trust from maybe the project developer and put it all into uh, a digital certificate that can mm. fully be monetized and fully be owned by the the corporate off taker, mm -hmm. uh, because there are nuances to you know ESG reporting and carbon reporting, which is beyond just scope one, two, and three. But you mm -hmm. have these sustainable development goals (SDGs). Mm. Yeah, you know you have TCFD has you know the Task Force for Climate and Financial Disclosure or something like that. Mm -hmm. They have all these nuances about are you being a good corporate citizen. And they're telling other stories besides just carbon. Yeah. So we're trying to quantify all that positive mm. attributes uh, into one immutable sort of yeah. form. Yeah. I want to take us on a little journey. I have no idea if this will be good for, for the air. <laughs> um, but I, I guess when I was growing up, I would always, this is a terrible analogy, I would get certificates of achievement 
all yeah. the time, which is like the little like piece of paper with the little, you mm-hmm. know, gold, gold foil gold, on it. Yeah. And I think when I graduated and started learning about recs and people keep talking about certificates, I'm like, are they handing around little pieces of paper that say this is this is when <laughs> this was cut for this megawatt hour? Mm-hmm. And you got to imagine that there's there's kind of a long history where, yeah, there was a time when yeah. stock was issued one share at a time. Yeah. It was a piece of paper. And mm-hmm. this was something they would physically pass around. That's and right. I am so thankful that we have like <laughs> blockchain now yeah. so that there's not warehouses of like stacks of paper that you have to search through. <laughs> right. But this is, I think when, when we talk about kind of there's data everywhere, like this is the modern world where a certificate encapsulates a ton of information. Um where you can actually use it for something. It's literally not locked on a piece of paper sitting in a warehouse, but it gives us this kind of provenance. It, mm-hmm. it, 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 it's in many ways, it's much more powerful than the, the original concept of a certificate yeah. um, because now it's accessible and useful. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's amazing to me that we've kind of come this far mm. where like this, this is something that we can kind of throw out there and, and have this kind of public transparency. Yeah. Um, because otherwise, what does a certificate really represent? It really just yeah. kind of represents a moment in time where you got a piece of paper. <laughs> I mean, b- before, the past, right? before blockchain, yeah. these, these certificates, whether they're paper or digital, had to live on a proprietary or closed database somewhere mm. yeah. that you had to log in and see. And it was hard to, like I said earlier, prove a lot of things. You have these auditors, which have their role. Um, but blockchain solved this tr- problem of how do you make something transparent on the internet Mm -hmm. without also it being copied a million times or also have these double claims of owning it. Mm -hmm. So it solved a sort of this ownership problem of data. Mm -hmm. And that's what fascinated me and that's why I decided to start this business was that uh, this is a data management problem at its heart and Mm -hmm. it's a data ownership Mm -hmm. problem. Mm -hmm. And blockchain is uniquely able to solve that problem. Because it's not, it's very clear who owns this piece of data. So, so, so we're, because I, you know, I used to work for a company where we used to provide certificates and like audit and all of that stuff. And this was maybe five, six years ago when we were talking about blockchain and how we need to start shifting from like handing out those paper <laughs> um, to giving blockchain certificates. So, how has that evolved and how have you seen that take shape in practice? Are certification bodies, actually handing out digital certificates based on this technology or is it still relatively new or, and not so well used i would say it's it's still new mm-hmm. um there are startup there's a, a big startup ecosystem around tokenizing carbon offsets there are some folks tokenizing recs mm-hmm. um breaking them into smaller pieces so retail customers can buy mm-hmm. you know a kilowatt mm-hmm. hour instead of a megawatt hour um there's also blockchain applications to payments, like facilitating payments in real mm. time, you know, with mm-hmm. various things in the power grid and and other places. But I, th- I would say that it's still new in that. Um, Is it being applied more vi- widely now? Are people accepting it as a certificate? There's still a lot of fear about it still being like the Wild mm. West or, mm. uh, you know, there's still a lot of... Um, Fear of fraud. Yeah. Mm. So I don't know when this was, maybe two years ago, Vera sort of shut down an account that was linked to tokenized offsets yeah. because they were left unretired maybe on the mm-hmm. Vera registry and then they were listed for sale and it really wasn't clear if this organization was doing things correctly, even though it, I think everything was published online and there was transparency in the way the smart contracts mm-hmm. and the platform worked. There's still a lot of hesitancy, hesitancy yeah. about it. So the legacy players are the the players who can sh- control like the issuance of these traditional certificates. Yeah. They haven't fully adopted. I don't yeah. think they have adopted at all. Yeah. Blockchain as a way to re mm-hmm. yeah. mm. build their infrastructure. Mm. But what you're seeing are these sort of layers on top mm. of the legacy re- registries that then pr- use blockchain technology to either give access to a larger market, yeah. like I was saying earlier, or just increase transparency so yeah. that the corporates can maybe have better reporting because yeah. they can verify on chain versus a black box. Yeah, because I can imagine like Amazon and Meta, who you're talking to in these industry uh, consortiums, would would be more open to adopting these technologies. Um, what are you seeing when you're talking to your customers when you present them your solution and that it's based on um, blockchain? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, we 
they like the idea of an independent mm-hmm. party making helping them make the claim instead mm-hmm. of being internal, you know, mm-hmm. trying to make the claim internally. Mm-hmm. Like I was saying earlier, there's a lot of hesitancy to make claims nowadays mm-hmm. or to show innovation in areas yeah. where you could just open yourself up to all this liability of uh, of saying you're you're cherry picking or greenwashing. Mm-hmm. So they like the idea of an independent platform. Mm-hmm. Um, the blockchain part specifically, you know, we don't highlight it as like a Web three or mm-hmm. or in your face blockchain company. It's more of a blockchain enabled back end yeah. thing that maybe customers wouldn't even know right. about. But w- but it has increased transparency and security. Yeah. So mm-hmm. we're not trying to really hit people over the face with the blockchain yeah. side. Yeah. I'm a data scientist. This yeah. is a just in my mind another database or another exactly. technology, yeah. just like a cloud infrastructure mm-hmm. that people, you know, maybe in a number of years ago, highlighting cloud as mm-hmm. a competitive advantage could have worked, but nowadays everyone everyone uses it, so it's no yeah. longer a competitive advantage. Mm-hmm. I think in some ways blockchain is becoming that. Yeah. It, it's if you use it correctly, right. um, you really shouldn't have to sort yeah. of promote it so much. Yeah, because I think m- I remember when it was first popularized, blockchain, everyone was like, let's create a blockchain sh- solution. But it was yeah. like, yeah, but what are you going to solve, right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. it's really the, it, the technology is irrelevant. It's really the solution. And yeah. so it's good to see that companies are more highlighting what you're doing. And then blockchain can really be at the background right. because it could yeah. be any other technology as long as it's doing what you want it right. to do. Mm. Yeah. And to, mm. to be clear, you have to solve a trust problem, I think, mm-hmm. to apply blockchain. Mm-hmm. The, mm-hmm. It's not efficient. It's actually inefficient mm. in a lot of other ways. So unless you're d- solving a trust problem, you should probably be using a different database. Mm. Got it. Mm. Uh, and just to be clear, we're not running our own blockchain. Mm. We're not uh, issuing tokens. Like we don't have like some of the DeFi or Web3 mm. type things. Um, we're using a public blockchain and we're just... Uh, minting NFTs mm-hmm. on this blockchain that are then traded on our on our platform. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Good. So uh, one of the things you mentioned is I think uh, you said you were at uh, EDPR before this, mm-hmm. and at some point you saw the future happening and you decided to make the leap. Kind of mm-hmm. walk us through that step. Yeah. So um, I was managing a team of data scientists at EDPR focused mostly on uh, operational asset performance. So there's a large fleet of solar and wind farms where we were making sure that equipment wasn't breaking down mm. and, and, and the performance of the assets was, was good. And then I transitioned, I began to see corporate demand from, our, from their customers about new types of enhancements, new types mm. of PPAs. Everybody was sort of thinking about how can we go beyond the, the standard So I got pulled into doing um, sort of market research and innovation, talking with their customers and and surveying the landscape of all these um, ideas on how to enhance um, these sustainability claims uh, of of these PPAs. And that's when I learned everything I could about 24-7 energy matching. And I I came across the Emissions First Partnership and what's called emissionality, which Mm is... um, which is the avoided emissions of, of generation. And so I put together uh, a proposal and I began to realize that there wasn't a lot of infrastructure or companies working on the emissionality side. There was quite a bit working on the, the hourly recs or mm. hourly energy matching side of it. Mm. And those, there were pilots ongoing with multiple companies. Um, but when I realized there was a lot of white space in this other side and it seemed more scalable and a better solution than energy matching, I thought it was an opportunity to, to, to sort of dive in mm-hmm. and do it. Um, I was doing a small startup, you know, I was, I, I was experimenting with this idea of using blockchain to tokenize the environmental attributes of other commodities. And so I thought, you know, the power market is really needs this solution. And I had been developing this idea for other commodities. So I was like, let's, let's do it. Mm-hmm. And so my loving wife was very supportive and mm-hmm. said, you know, let's go. And, um, and so that's when I started and I have a, a small team, but we were, were able to, you know, work on it full time and, and put it out there. And I think once the, once 
the pros and cons and, and the and the value proposition of our platform is known compared to the others, I think uh, I think it'll come around and we'll be successful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But yeah, it was from talking directly to customers while I was working with these energy developers, and then surveying the the market mm-hmm. where this gap was sort of identified. Yeah, and and how did you have the conviction that you'd be the one who have to do this? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I recognized it was a data management problem, sort of like mm-hmm. what I was said earlier. Mm. And I, you know, I've been a data scientist for, I'm not sure, seven years now. Uh, I was an engineer before that. Mm. And so I was surprised this problem, I guess, wasn't solved earlier. Mm. Maybe a lot of founders th- feel this way is mm-hmm. that, you know, mm-hmm. am I crazy and this problem doesn't exist? <laughs> or yeah, it is. People haven't realized that there's a solution already out there. It's just mm-hmm. not mm-hmm. in the market. And so, when I realized that, well, why aren't these, why aren't these corporates structuring PPAs with this marginal emissions data? Like, why mm-hmm. is this not happening? Mm-hmm. The data is available. Um, you know, the the demand is there. So mm-hmm. why isn't this not happening? And I realized that it was just a failure of solid data infrastructure and data ownership. Like mm-hmm. there was no good way of owning the avoided emissions or there's mm-hmm. no good way of monetizing it for the project developers. And so when I realized that it was a solvable problem and the technology was out there, mm-hmm. um, I thought I, I thought I should go put something in the market and see mm-hmm. if it would work. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and it's that confluence of you had that prior experience with using tokenization, mm-hmm. being at the, the right place of seeing the data gaps. Um, no, so that, that, that's an interesting um, confluence. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, and and I'm always curious to hear about that moment when you decided to quit your job and go into like this uncertain start your own company. Mm-hmm. You know what was going through your mind? How did you make that decision? And um, in terms of also like hiring and forming a team around it, were you able to raise some funds earlier on, or are you doing it at the back of you know your own savings for now? Right. Mm. Yeah, I mean, first time founder. Um, I've always wanted to to build a company, and 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 my wife has started a company before, and she had an entrepreneurial spirit, and mm-hmm. so uh, her encouragement was really important to this happening. Um, you know, there were a few a few folks that were also very energized by this idea and were able to work for you know sweat equity and and work part time because there was no funds. Mm-hmm. So we have been self funded and bootstrapped. We have a few angels that have helped, mm-hmm. but um, but yeah, I mean it's been hard, you know, doing everything that a founder has to do. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I. Uh, it's been an amazing journey just to learn about mm-hmm. uh, how many hats a founder has to wear in order to really put together an MVP or something mm-hmm. that um, you can get some validation before, mm-hmm. so you can get funding. You know, mm-hmm. um, I had a, mi- a lot of misunderstandings about the process mm-hmm. in terms of like, you know, is it just building a compelling pitch deck and then raising money and then building your product? Uh, which in general, the answer is no, unless you're in a <laughs> zero interest rate hype cycle yeah. industry or have a huge team or, or, or been prior, you know, been successful in a prior enterprise or something. Maybe that works. But what the hard reality for at least for me and maybe a lot of your founders that you've talked to is that, no, you got to somehow build a very crappy MVP. And you got to be somewhat ashamed of taking it to customers, <laughs> but getting some customer feedback. Uh, ideally revenue or some sort of pilot to say, you know, I don't like it the way it is, but I like your vision and we will agree to try it or, Mm -hmm. or, or do it. And then use that traction Mm -hmm. to demonstrate to investors that there is a market for this and there is demand for this. Mm -hmm. Um, So anyway, that, that evolution has been, has been interesting and, you know, there's been a number of pivots in there, um, but it's, I wouldn't give it up for anything, really. It's been an amazing uh, growth Good. opportunity for me. Good. And and now that you're out um, in the market for a seed round, um, how have you found that process in Houston? Well, I've, you know, I've been in Houston for a long time, so I don't have full context. Mm. I haven't lived in Silicon Valley or anywhere mm. else, but I have traveled to 
different places and meet with investors. Um, you know, it seems to me that Houston, you know, I think they're, they love hard, hard technologies or hard tech and they love devices and actual inventions and new mm -hmm. manufacturing processes or new equipment. Uh, I think software is something that is a little bit scary because they feel that mm. if it was mm. if it was worth investing, why haven't large firms in Silicon Valley and New York already invested? And so it's like, am I missing something? It was being a Houston, you know, angel mm -hmm. or investor. Mm -hmm. It's like it's not. Uh, so being an early investor in a software in the energy space, especially in this carbon climate sustainability sector, mm -hmm. which. Even though there are renewable energy companies in Houston, it's not exactly Houston's strong mm. suit mm. yet in mm. terms of climate tech investment. Uh, maybe it's more on the hydrogen and battery, like I said, the equipment side and mm. not the software side. So there's a little bit of hesit hesitancy there to think about what's innovative in, I guess you'd call it carbon tech or sustainability. Mm. Because carbon accounting and sustainability is, you know, it's nuanced and it's sort of black magic in terms of like you're relying on a lot of emotional or policy mm -hmm. or corporate motivations that maybe uh, a lot of energy or Houston folks don't understand. You know, you go to Europe, a lot stronger sustainability culture, right? You mm -hmm. go to California or New York, mm -hmm. there's mm -hmm. a lot more culture there. In Houston, for better or worse, I feel that culture has been has been changed because a lot of energy companies are on the defense maybe mm -hmm. at least mm -hmm. maybe not recent maybe not now but at least in the past they were viewed mm -hmm. as being attacked by this sustainability culture so they have a bit of a defensiveness about it when really hopefully mm -hmm. it could be viewed as more of an opportunity and i think tax credits and ira and and other things have maybe changed that uh because the dollars i guess are there now so that changes a lot of minds but mm -hmm. um now you see every corporate VC and these energy companies have a whole portfolio of carbon capture, hydrogen, batteries, whatever. Mm -hmm. But I guess being innovative and being open-minded to like what story can be told with sustainability and with mm -hmm. carbon claims mm -hmm. is something that, at least on a voluntary basis, mm -hmm. wasn't part of the Houston culture. So anyway, I don't know if that answers your question directly, but it, that's just my feeling mm -hmm. when I talk to, to Houston Angels is they're more about Show me cash flow, you know, show me concrete demand. Don't try to sell me some vision of mm -hmm. enhanced sustainability because I don't know if anybody's going to pay for that. And I don't know if that's really mm -hmm. the trend in the market because maybe most, yeah. most Houston angels aren't on the trend or in, mm -hmm. you know, knowledgeable on the trends. I think that's a trends. valid point. I yeah. don't think we're so mature in our sort of thinking there, in, especially compared to like California mm -hmm. where they've been, you know, doing this for a while, there's probably more innovation around this I would say this, New York there. City is and York leading City. in the- And New York City, the, yeah, that's true. At least on the, on the, on the maybe yeah. I, I, would, mm. I would call it the carbon tech side or like mm. the, the sustainability side. Maybe not the hardware of climate mm. tech mm -hmm. or the energy transition, but at mm. least on the these new data platforms that are helping uh, on these carbon claims, mm. it seems like there's a lot of VCs out of New York and mm. Europe that are mm. helping. Mm -hmm. And those conversations are completely different. You know, yeah. there's VCs that are doing, you know, regenerative agriculture and, and, you know, wildlife restoration type projects. I mean, they're really into the weeds on mm. all of these sustainability trends, mm. you know, way ahead of the rest of the world. And so they already say, oh, I completely see that the energy market is going to trend in the same tr trend that the broader industry is going, which is more disclosures more proof of your claims, mm -hmm. more scope through reporting. So they see the trends, I think, in a lot more detail mm -hmm. where the Houston folks don't. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I think that's one of the, you, you kind of touched on a fundamental difference in kind of the investment mm -hmm. philosophy is sometimes with a portfolio, you just got to bet on the vertical. But if you don't see the vertical kind of growing, mm -hmm. it's hard to define a, a, a right. portfolio around it. And I'm not sure um, as, as much as the Houston like angel community might see a lot of climate deals. They haven't necessarily picked verticals that they they know they want to double down on. Right. Um, but you can definitely see, like in places mm -hmm. like New York, where they're kind of doubling down on the carbon tech, you know, accounting like you described. 
Um, and you see it all the time in California where they're going to bet heavy on AI today because yeah. it's it's the vertical of the day, right? Yeah. Um, but here it, it it's a lot more measured in terms of wanting to see that that market really take off, mm-hmm. and that doesn't necessarily mm-hmm. get you pole position as an investor if you're you're kind of late. Yeah. Right. Well, you need some edge. Exactly. Right. Yeah. You need some. So there's specialty VCs out there, right? Mm-hmm. And some that specify in a very specific vertical or domain and they feel like they have an edge in their deal flow and if yeah if a houston investor doesn't feel like they have an edge in this space they're just not gonna Mm -hmm. write a check Mm -hmm. um but hopefully what we will be what we can do to close the seed round is to take the commitments from those Mm -hmm. specialty vcs to then turn back around to the houston folks and say look these folks have done the due diligence they know the market better than Mm -hmm. you do and they are going to write a check so, you know, join on in and let's fill the round and mm. sort of go go crazy and let's build something amazing. Mm. So it helps, I think, sort of grease the wheels for them to say, look, somebody else is vouching for Yeah, for someone us. else thinks it's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so maybe we'll we'll follow along. Yeah. So maybe maybe they're not gonna be necessarily follow um leaders. Mm-hmm. Um right. But they'll follow along until they get to a point where we have more understanding. Because here, when we talk about energy, it's oil and gas, yeah, yep. right. Whereas energy is so much more than that. Yep. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. But I think mm. they they both need to be done together. The mm-hmm. energy transition is going to mm. take obviously um, technological breakthroughs mm. and deployment of technology at a mm. huge scale, which Houston can do. But the other side of that is the data, the incentives, the claims the sustainability reporting, the greater market demand Mm -hmm. for green premium or or the attributes of that, that part of it definitely needs to be there. Mm -hmm. I think that you need both to be successful in the the energy transition, in my opinion. Mm. How do you think that's evolving or changing or what needs to be done in Houston so that we're better prepared Mm -hmm. for this transition and to lead the transition and also fund it? Yeah, so we're asking hard questions here. Yeah, yeah. that's a good one. So <laughs> yeah. the way I, I guess the way I would frame this is that there's only so much capital mm-hmm. to go around and you can't boil the ocean and just like deploy it everywhere. So I think the question is is where do you deploy it um for the highest return? Mm-hmm. Not return necessarily of of money, but uh the lowest abatement cost, carbon mm-hmm. abatement cost, I would call it. Mm-hmm. And that's just a fancy way of saying that if you could avoid, with a million dollars, you can avoid car- more carbon by building a wind farm in West Virginia because coal is very heavily used in West mm-hmm. Virginia, then that same million dollars mm-hmm. or that same wind farm is going to have a better abatement cost there than if it's another one in West Texas. <laughs> so like the deployment yeah. and the strategic deployment yeah. of capital, I think needs to be yeah. informed by mm. carbon data and just by demand, I mean, there needs to be demand for uh, avoided emissions, and then that will send the market signal to deploy that capital where you can target the coal generation and target yeah. get the most avoided emissions. And then now you can funnel those resources. Right. And just to segue a little bit, or just to have a, yeah. a, a brief aside, that's in contrast to the the framework I believe is being proposed by this twenty four seven hourly matching, which mm-hmm. is. Let's just deploy tons of batteries Mm -hmm. where there's already a lot of renewables like in Mm -hmm. California and Texas so that we can match every hour. We can prove every hour is from renewable generation. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fine goal. I think that's probably the final step. And I know their intentions are good, but that's not, in my mind, a good deployment of capital. Mm -hmm. Because why make California 100% renewables when you still have coal in Montana, West Virginia, India, China, yeah. elsewhere. Yeah. It's much more efficient use of capital to take that battery and go put it somewhere else. Okay. Yeah. So that's the market signal that I want to fix. And I'm trying to pr- provide an alternative to the 24 seven framework that I think is an inefficient capital allocation yeah. framework. Yeah. I think that's been like what I've, what I've loved about our conversation today is what's been bothering me is that we, I think we still approach the energy transition and solving the climate crisis in a very sort of 
capitalistic mindset in terms of like profit first, whatever makes mm. us more money, instead of looking at it in a more holistic, where are we where are we creating the most impact? Right. Right. And and look at it holistically because then also look at, okay, deploying batteries for all of California. What are the externalities of that? Right. And I'm sure there's, you know, where are we getting the batteries from yeah. and what's inside the batteries and how are we going to recycle those batteries and all of that thing that we look at it more holistically because it's not, we're just going to create other problems if we're not doing that. That's right. So mm -hmm. the same way when we, the, the business analysis that we do for a project and look at like, how do we maximize profit or reduce our cost? I think we need to take into account our, the environmental impact in to all these projects mm -hmm. and look at it more holistically in terms of lifetime emissions, but also in terms of, yeah, what's the best way for us to deploy this capital? Is it here or is it in Virginia or Montana or somewhere right. else? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. But I also think you're pointing to something else that's kind of uh, maybe, um, I think there are two minds within the, the carbon accounting or the, the climate uh, world where you got one group that says, well, we really need carbon to be expensive because we want to disincentivize, you know, the creation of emissions. But you know, if you think about it from a Texas perspective, and what you're saying is, in some ways, we want to be so efficient with how we deploy capital that carbon should be two dollars a ton because we're so good at finding that place to abate mm -hmm. that every dollar just is much more. It goes much further than trying to price it at a thousand dollars a ton, and and I think yeah. there's a there's a challenge there where, in, in in some people's minds, you know, they're kind of using the credit as a tax, but. Um, I think what we're talking about here is using it as a mechanism to identify efficiency. Yeah. And I think Houston, as like a big capital projects kind of uh, ecosystem, looks at everything of like, how do we minimize cost? How do we yeah. get that barrel oil out the cheapest? Mm -hmm. And if that means I have to account for the carbon and I can figure out how to make it, a, you know, $2 a ton for the carbon, we're going right. to have the same, we have the right kind of net neutrality from a carbon accounting perspective. Right. Let's develop that project. Let's not develop the other one where maybe the, yeah. you know, the abatement is $1,000 a ton. But we feel good, mm. yeah. right? Because that's a that's a classic greenwashing yeah. challenge, right? And that's hard. Yeah. I think it's hard it's for difficult. like different groups to reconcile. But it's it's almost counterintuitive that efficiency in the carbon market means cheap carbon, right? Yeah, it's it's really fascinating and complicated topic because I read this week that there you know a, there's a bill in the U.S. Congress mm. to you know describe what a carbon tariff could look like, modeled after the the, the EU carbon tariff in terms of penalties and taxes. Mm. I'm sympathetic to some of that. I, I like disclosures mm -hmm. and I like like publishing carbon accounting and, and reporting. In general, sort of philosophically, I don't really like tax as a punishment mm -hmm. as a way to to drive change. I much prefer the carrot mm -hmm. and not necessarily tax credits or incentives like cash because they work to, to start a market like maybe hydrogen, for example. Mm -hmm. I think they work to start a market, but they're maybe not the right way of doing it in a fairly more ma mature market because they can be gamed. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of crony capitalism in terms of how these things are done. And at the beginning, I talked about the REC and t tax credit markets somehow like chain manipulating the market to maybe create some malinvestments. So I like this idea of connecting increased demand mm -hmm. or maybe a green premium mm -hmm. from customers um, and providing some sort of proof of emission in the supply chain back to the producers as a way to reward the responsible or the lower carbon version of that producer in that market with additional revenue. Mm -hmm. And that positive market signal or that carrot is then going to change the industry. And you use capital capitalism's um, sort of nature to your advantage and that they're going to now take that additional revenue into their projections or project finance or whatever it is and now they're going to be more smart about or smarter about how they um, build their business or operate their business because they see that revenue mm -hmm. um so yeah it's it's difficult I, th I think there's a lot of people in the sustainability world that really want to punish oil and gas mm -hmm. they see it as the enemy and not just because I live in Houston, but I don't really like that framing of it because mm -hmm. um, it ignores reality in terms of how much fossil fuels we, we need for our quality of life and 
how it could be depriving other developing nations mm -hmm. of quality of life if we don't you know give them access to mm -hmm. certain fossil fuels i don't like coal mm -hmm. uh, obviously you can generate electricity in many other ways so using coal doesn't make any sense but uh until there's viable mm -hmm. alternatives to um you know to plastics and to lubricants and to mm -hmm. you know gasoline and things that's cost effective and lower carbon to your point like the entire life cycle is lower carbon um then we need we need some of those fossil fuels and so i don't like framing it as oil and gas is the enemy mm -hmm. um and so incentivizing with a positive market signal that they could they could be more uh successful by tapping into this green premium is mm. to me the better way to do it. Good. No, I appreciate that. We're we're, we're kind of coming up on time. So um, as we wrap up, um, what's one thing that our audience could do to support you in your journey? Yeah, well, um, you know, I guess just really the main main thing is to understand that that this sustainability journey and the, the energy mm -hmm. transition is a bit more nuanced. And so, you know, for the general public, do some research into, you know, the way the power market works mm -hmm. or the way supply chains work may not be fun topic to read about, you know, on the weekend, but, uh, educate yourself on, on how difficult it actually is to, to get our quality of life mm -hmm. with a free renewable resource that comes to us every day in the form mm -hmm. of the sun and the wind and how difficult of a problem that is mm -hmm. and that you can't just have the government spend hundreds of billions of dollars and think that the problem is going to go away and that if you just voted for one political party over the other we will have a sustainable mm -hmm. uh, world i think you have to um just understand that there's some nuances and that um you know specifically for us you know come join our our community and, and visit our website and give me some feedback on on what we're doing we're publishing our white papers mm -hmm. and our methodologies and we're launching our our platform um and we also want the retail folks to be able to buy our certificates and be a part of the of the journey too. This isn't just for huge Fortune 500 companies. Yeah. So. And what is your website? Cleanincentive.com. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. My Twitter handle is clean underscore Casey, and um, you know, I I love a good debate. So good. Hit me up.